Log on, tune in, find out. Another good idea from Cambridge. A great pleasure now to introduce Professor Nidal Gassoum, who is a Professor of Physics at the American University of Sharjah. He obtained his MSc and PhD degrees from the University of California at San Diego and uh, did research at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, so he is also, though, very interested in um, the whole issue of uh, science and religion in the context of Islam. Uh, and we have this, uh, this book that he's written on our bookstore, Islam's Quantum Question, Reconciling Muslim Tradition and Modern Science. And I think there's nobody I can think of better qualified to, 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 to talk about this topic of Islam and modern science. So over to you, Dal. Thank you very much. For the <coughs> Excuse me if my voice is not perfectly clear, but uh, I got a throat infection a couple of weeks ago, and it has taken a long time to go away, partly because... All of my family members tell me not to take antibiotics, but anyway. Um, <laughs> I'm delighted to be here. I thank the Faraday Institute, uh, Rodney, Dennis, and Zoe, and everybody for uh, the invitation and for the opportunity to come again. Uh, it's been here, uh, I've been here a couple of times, and it's always a pleasure. A um, couple of things before I start on this. Uh, first of all, you will be perhaps pleasantly surprised to see several resonances between some of the ideas I will be presenting here, even though it says Islam, and the talk that uh, Professor Hutchinson just gave us. And I think that will fuel the discussion further into probably the evening, since there will be a discussion session in the evening for all of the speakers. And it's good that we have some uh, uh, cross-correlations between different talks. Secondly, even though it says Islam, and I will be mentioning at least once or twice a couple of verses from the Quran and things like this, uh, you could, I am sure, realize that you might be able to replace the word Islam with Christianity or religion in general, and perhaps 99% of the talk would still stand and the ideas there would still fit. So it is in the context of Islam, as Rodney said, but it is uh, also much more general in talking about even things like naturalism and, and the definition of science and all of that is going to, to come about. Uh, here's the outline. Islam has had a long history and relation with science in general. Now, of course, one of the key issues here is what do we mean by science, as we heard in the previous talk. And my, my contention is there is a significant difference, a fundamental difference, between what I call modern science, which I'll try to define later, and science as it has been understood by various traditions and throughout history for a long, long time until quote, modernity. Uh, so, for all that time, and until the present, there has been this long interconnection, debate, discussions, fruitful uh, cross-pollination between Islam and science, and I will be trying to show you some of that from the classical uh, era of Islam and from the modern times, because as I will try to explain, modern science has presented new issues to uh, the Muslim thinkers. So what views of science did classical Muslim thinkers develop? How did they understand science, nature, in relation to God, in relation to theology, more generally, in relation to philosophy, uh, in relation to methodology, <coughs> epistemology, etc.? What was the res then in modern times, what was the response of Muslim intellectuals to modern science, which I would contend the prime problem with modern science is this claim of naturalism, really. And so the Muslim thinkers said, okay, so how do we deal with this? And this fast developing, exponentially uh, developing science, tremendously successful with all kinds of claims, including and uh, in the end with some arrogance claiming scientism or claiming that we can explain it all. So how did Muslim intellectuals respond to that? And then in the end, if I may, just maybe in one slide, sort of present to you a summary of the book so if you don't want to buy the book, you can just read the one slide and, uh, and get the gist of it. Uh, so that will be sort of the end of it. Now, in Islam, we always begin with the Quran. Why do we always begin with the Quran? Because the Quran is sort of the reference uh, on so many issues, not just on God and religion as we classically understand it, 
but also on life, on humans, on society, on history, on future, on everything. In fact, one of the uh, Western thinkers described Islam as a culture grounded in a book. And so we always go back, in fact, another a bishop, Bishop Kenneth Cragg from Scotland, I think he's still alive, uh, said, if you want to convince Muslims of anything, you need to make sure that you refer to the Quran, or you need to find something in the Quran that justifies, or at least says that what, whatever you are presenting, whatever you are claiming, is not in contradiction with the Quran. So there is the central place of the Quran, and in the Quran there are many, many verses related to nature and related to knowledge in general. In fact, I will be explaining in a minute that the idea of science or the idea of knowledge is a bit fuzzy in the Islamic culture, or has been, until we get to modern times and we start to try to epistemologically define what we mean by really by science. Uh, but um, Abdul Salam, who I'll be referring to a little bit later, a Nobel Prize winner Pakistani physicist uh, in the 70s, um, was fond of repeating that in the Quran there are about 750 verses that talk about, about uh, uh, nature and knowledge, science, quote-unquote, uh, three times more than the verses that talk about religious obligations. So the implication is that the push, the encouragement to go and observe and contemplate and study God's uh, book or seeing book, the book that we see in, instead of the book that we read, is three times more uh, prevalent in the Quran than the injunctions of thou shalt do and thou shalt not do. Uh, so I've just listed a few of them here just to show you. Um, science now in the broader <coughs> Islamic culture, in the prophetic traditions, what we call the hadith, the statements of the Prophet, Prophet Muhammad, and in some other traditional statements from the scholars of all times, the ink of the scholar is more sacred than the blood of the martyr. God put out there a cure for every disease he created, meaning go and find it, go and find it, the, the, the cure. And this is a, st a statement by the Prophet himself. An hour's contemplation or study of nature is better than a year's adoration or worship of God. Uh, seek knowledge even in China. Uh, <laughs> meaning as far as you can go. Uh, not that China is, is particular in any other way. It's only particular geographically, or at least in those times it was particular uh, geographically. Now, as I just mentioned or, or, or referred to very briefly, Science in the Islamic culture um, has been a bit conflated with the word knowledge. In fact, the word for both in the Quran and in the whole uh, Muslim tradition until today. In fact, when we teach, I teach science in English because I'm, I'm at an American university, but I have taught also science in Arabic. And the word that we use for science in Arabic is ilm, ilm over there, this. But this word ilm, when you go back, is the same word that means knowledge in general. In fact, for a long time there was a debate or discussion as to what does the word ilm mean. Does it refer to religious knowledge? Does it refer to sacred knowledge? Does it refer to knowledge more generally? Does it refer to what we call science, meaning the knowledge of, of nature or, or knowledge of anything else? And then when we got to modern science, which, as I have already implied, made a significant change in uh, the definition of, of the science, people still use the same word ilm until today. Um, but modern thinkers, and these are both modern thinkers, in fact, Sardar lives right here in North London, uh, Anis, uh, Sardar, uh, Ziyad bin Sardar has many, many books that you can find, etc., has dealt with questions of Islam and science from, from modern perspectives, even postmodern perspectives, he finds himself as widely Postmodernist uh, says, ilm in the in Islam integrates the pursuit of knowledge with values, combines factual insight, factual insight, with metaphysical concerns, and promotes an outlook of balance and genuine synthesis. Meaning, it is much broader. It's not, you know, the science that we have been discussing uh, this morning, and that I will be emphasizing a little bit more a little bit later. Uh, it is a much more uh, in a uh, widely encompassing concept. Uh, Munawar Anis, who lives in the States now and passes some time in, in France sometimes, uh, has written that ilm, this concept that I have now translated as knowledge plus science, 
is all comprehensive and profound uh, and the profound notion in the Quran second only to Tawheed Tawheed is the oneness of God so that tells you the preeminence or eminence of this concept of knowledge and science if it comes in the Islamic tradition second only to Tawheed meaning the oneness of God which is the the core concept of all of Islam then this is significant now let me show you here I'm going to spend maybe 15-20 minutes on the classical times, the, a little bit of history, but not history for the sake of history, of they did some great things, here are some great scientists, etc. Uh, we are in need of that a little bit because the history of science has not, uh, I contend, been written very objectively or very carefully. But aside from that, as to who did what and who preceded whom, who really discovered and who invented what, that's a different uh, discussion altogether. What we need to see is how people understood the pursuit of science, the pursuit of uh, objective knowledge. And that is why I want to go back and see how the Islamic tradition dealt with that. So, uh, I will have a slide on From Theology to Science, the Mu'tazilid philosophy of nature. I will come back to this and explain what, I, what this Mu'tazilid thing is. Then a very, very interesting correspondence that occurred between two of the greatest thinkers in the history of Islam. Biruni, and Biruni, who lived in Afghanistan, and Avicenna, who lived in Persia. And I will explain how that discussion, this is almost exactly a thousand years ago, was trying to delineate the realm of science from the realm of philosophy, from the realm of theology. Uh, Ibn al-Haytham, whom I will present to you as the first modern scientist, at least in the Islamic times, the Muslim times, again also almost exactly a thousand years ago. And go back a little bit to Al-Biruni and explain, was he a modernist in the way I will define, or was he a classicist or a, uh, a medieval scientist in the way we define medieval science? So I will explain that too. From theology to science, the Mu'tazilid philosophy of nature. The Mu'tazilids, to make a long, long story short, are a theological school known in Islam as the rationalists of theology, one of the earliest schools of theology in Islam from the 8th century AD, actually, and started out uh, from the beginning as very, very rationalistic. R by rationalistic, I don't mean anywhere near atheism or even ma uh, materialism, but really the power of the mind, uh, the power of reason was paramount in all of their theology and philosophy. Now, Here's my one-line uh, summary of their whole uh, um, derivation of sort of principles of science from theology. Divine justice for the Mu'tazilites, the first principle was God is one. There is no uh, um, argument over this or compromise. Number two, <coughs> God is absolutely just, extremely important. God is absolutely just. We are still in the realm of theology. And then from that, they derive some important physical principles. How? Huh? If God is just, then there must be free will. Otherwise, he is not going to be just. If I don't have completely free will to do what I'm going to do, then how on earth is he going to, or how on heaven is he going to judge me? <laughs> so, I must have total free will, or else there is no meaning to divine justice. And if I have free will, then there must be causality. Because if I do things, then they better execute the way uh, I, the way the causes, the way I produce the causes, it, they must lead to the consequences in an orderly and methodical manner. So, we, we get from divine justice to causality in just a few steps. Divine creation, God created the world. This is a concept, this is the principle of Islam. God is the creator. Uh, but how did he create the world and how does the world function? The Mu'tazilids argue that there must be causal relations, as we just explained. These causal relations imply some kind of laws, some order. Otherwise, if it's not ordered, then there's not going to be causality. One day I do something and some effect occurs and the other day it's different. And this implies that there must be some inherent capacities in objects, what we today in physics call parameters, mass, electric charge, whatever, 
things that allow objects to respond in an automatic manner every time there is the same cause or the same force applied, you would say, today. Listed phenomena are probabilistic, meaning they are not deterministic, they are contingent in the old language. Probabilistic meaning that they don't always follow exactly, we don't, the world is not completely deterministic. Why? Simply because there is human agency. Because we have some capacity to push things one way or another. And so because we are here, then the world is not completely deterministic. So this implies that there is something, some effect in nature, simply because of the existence of, of humans and their free will. So this is important to understand. Nature is atomic, they said. Uh, divisible up to cores, and there are jumps in nature. Remember this, remember, this is more than a thousand years ago. And they were speaking like this. So you can see that we start from theology, divine creation, <laughs> divine justice, etc., and then quickly we get into, really, physics. I mean, all physics, but physics. Now, the Biruni Avicenna correspondence, this is Avicenna, this is Al Biruni. Both of them lived in uh, Persia, Afghanistan, about a thousand years ago. Uh, Biruni was actually a little bit older than Avicenna, but Avicenna has made this big name to himself and was known throughout. Uh, people consider him today as probably the most important philosopher of the Islamic times. I tend to prefer Averroes, but we'll get to Averroes a little bit later. But just to tell you the importance of Avicenna, his book, The Canon of Medicine, most people think of him as a physician instead of a philosopher, even though the philosophers consider him as the most important philosopher. His book, The Canon of Medicine, was prevalent and used and translated, used in Europe until the 16th, 17th century. An extremely important uh, uh, scientist, philosopher, theologian, etc. And they, they had a long series of exchanges. Uh, Sayyid Nasser, whom I'll mention a little bit later, uh, who translated these and published them in English in the 70s, in the, in the late 70s, said the significance of the questions involved in, these, in this correspondence, marks one of the highlights of Islamic intellectual history, and in fact, medieval natural philosophy and science in general. Now, what happened then? I mean, what did they exchange that was so important and so significant? Biruni rejected the necessity of circular motions of heavenly objects. Essentially, to make a long story short, uh, Avicenna was hugely Aristotelian, and Biruni was, in the end, a real scientist. He was questioning. He was, why, how come, just because Aristotle said we don't have to follow. And so he goes and essentially uh, attacks, in a polite manner, attacks Avicenna as being the Aristotelian representative and says, how come this? Why isn't this allowed? Why would this be? But in raising these questions, you can see the science. And in the end, he tells, when, when the answer is not satisfactory to him from Avicenna, he turns to Avicenna and he says, you know the difference between you and me, why we can't agree, is because you're a philosopher and I'm a scientist. And that's the difference. Um, <clears throat> Biruni rejects the necessity of circular motion of heavenly objects. So why do they have to go in circles? I mean, think about it. This is a thousand years ago. This is 500, 600 years before Kepler, before the elliptical orbit. I mean, he didn't say elliptical. He said, why do they have to be circular? There's no reason. Uh, defends atomic the atomic worldview, but this is not new, as we've seen. Considers it impossible to have worlds of different nature. He says, why does Aristotle say we cannot have worlds of different nature out there? Why? I don't see why not. Um, and Avicenna starts to sort of justify and, and apologize in an apologetic point of view. Biruni adopted induction. You see, uh, uh, this is why he defined himself as a scientist in the end. He says, we have to start from the facts on the ground. We cannot start from from first principles and then derive things. This is not philosophy. You cannot, you know, just agree on a, on a principle and then say, okay, then it means the world functions like this. You have to start with the facts on the ground and observe and then induct, generalize, infer a law and go on from there. And Ibn Sina remained a deductionist. Now, Averroes. Averroes, 12th century Andalusian on the other side of the Islamic world, Andalusian philosopher, um, and scientist, and physician, and uh, um, uh, jurist. He was the Qadil Qudrat in Arabic. He was the, the supreme, supreme Court Justice, if you like, in those times. Was the physician of the court. Was an astronomer. He has a, he has a, a, a letter, I mean a letter meaning a booklet, uh, criticizing or arguing uh, with the Ptolemaic 
uh, model of the, of the solar system or of the world in those times, but most importantly, a philosopher. Insists on causality. He says, why we have to have causality? Now he comes to it from, from a philosophical point of view. He says, or else reason is, needs to be abandoned. If things don't follow cause effect, then reason is violated and there's no point. Insists on dealing only with what is physically accessible and knowable. He says, you know, don't tell me about things that we cannot get to, or we cannot see, or we cannot understand. If we want to describe nature, then we need to describe what is accessible to us from nature. This is not a denial that there is nothing else underneath or beyond. There is metaphysics, there is, as we now say, perhaps another dimension or something spiritual or whatever. But he says, don't claim to describe things that are not accessible to us. Softly deterministic, this is where I sort of disagree with him a little bit, but uh, accepts God's right and power to act wherever he wishes. Uh, I would say, I think I have a slide on miracles in a moment. And I say, miracles was one of the key turn points on, in, in many of those theological <coughs> scientific discussions. Uh, Averroes, Ibn Rushd, as he is known in Arabic, accepted miracles. He said, no, there are, they can, they can be. And God acts in the world, but, he insists, this is why I put this statement in blue, he says, but, even when God acts or intervenes in the world, he intervenes uh, in such a way as to preserve the laws and order in nature. In other words, he uses the, the laws of nature. Don't ask me how, but that's, that's the claim. In other words, there are no violations of physical laws, is what Averroes is claiming. Now, Biruni, before I get to Ibn al-Haytham, Biruni is the first modern and theistic Muslim scientist. Because I will explain in a moment, I'm sort of a bit jumping or, or placing the ideas not in a completely ordered manner, but I will, I will argue in a minute, or I will submit to you, that the difference between the modern, modernistic science and the classical science that we find in the Islamic tradition and elsewhere, is that the modern tradition is purely naturalistic. You cannot invoke four explanations of physical or natural phenomena anything else but natural causes. That's naturalism. You cannot invoke spirit, you cannot invoke God, you cannot invoke uh, anything, any other, anything else that is not naturalistic. This is modern science. In the old science, Everything was related to God, theistic, meaning you could explain, you could ask me, so how come uh, is the, uh, 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 the earth is the way it is, or atmosphere, or whatever, I said, because God will, willed it so. Because one, uh, God wanted there to be an atmosphere for us to breathe and to prosper. Now, that is an old way of explaining or justifying things. Today, that would be non-secular, that would be non-acceptable. But Biruni is both, and that's why I find Biruni a very, very interesting person. Extremely devout, but fully uh, scientific in his argument. As I explained a moment ago, he was, he was starting from the grounds, he was saying we need to look at, at observations, we cannot start from first principles, and we need to adopt naturalistic explanations. But at the same time, I need to always remind myself, and I need to always interpret things in a way that is related to God. This could be, I contend, a model for the Islamic, uh, Islamic reconciliation or conciliation, harmonization between modern science and Islamic theism. And it could be a model for, for more general uh, uh, theism. Very rigorous methodology, always critical, uh, critically reviewing older theories. Uh, there's no argument from authority in Al-Biruni whatsoever, ever, from anywhere. As we saw, he was, he was very at ease in criticizing Aristotle and debating things with the greatest scholars. <laughs> Reported his own observations, never discarded data just because it didn't seem to fit, and like Ptolemy, for example. Uh, displayed a spirit of tolerance, never showing any prejudice against different religious sects or races, even those that he found to be not monotheistic. Uh, he, was a, he was an expert on India, for example. Clearly distinguished between philosophers and mathematicians. Ma by mathematicians, he meant scientists in those times. Or between metaphysics and science. 
and address science-related issues of relevance to Islam, for example, prayer times. He has a whole book explaining how we calculate prayer times and, and how we determine you know, the start of Ramadan and things like this. So for him, there was absolutely no contention, no problem whatsoever in addressing issues of religion where science could be an important factor. And so he was at ease in, in moving from... Uh, moving between the two lanes, so to speak, but always in a rigorous manner, or never sort of compromising his principles. So that's a good one. So we could continue on this, stated that the motive behind his research in the scientific fields is Allah's verses. He said, when I read Allah's verses, some of which I, I quoted at the very beginning, then I found, or I was enticed to go and explore the world and to go and try to understand God's creation and so forth, which is a very valid source of illumination or source of encouragement. And others before him had done the same, al Batani, etc., but we don't have time to go into that. Now, Ibn al-Haytham. al is a very interesting figure. Let me quote for you here <coughs> something that you will find quite interesting. Jim al-Khalili, since many of you here live in the UK, uh, are probably familiar with Jim al-Khalili. Jim al-Khalili is of Iraqi origin, uh, of Christian Iraqi origin, I think, even though now he describes himself as atheistic or, or non-believing. Um, but I think he was brought to the UK when he was 10 years old or something and has lived here for all his life. He's a professor of physics, a great popularizer of, of science, has received prizes and awards, has lectured at the Royal Society, has had BBC TV series and books, etc. So... Um, Two years ago, two and a half years ago, he had this BBC TV series titled Science and Islam. And his, this is what he said about, about Ibn al-Haytham. He said, Isaac Newton is the undisputed father of modern optics, or so we are told at school. Yet, in the field of optics, Newton himself stood on the shoulders of a giant who lived 700 years earlier. Without doubt, another great physicist who is worthy of ranking up alongside Newton is Al-Hassan Ibn al-Haytham, who lived a thousand years ago first in Iraq, and then moved to Egypt and died in Egypt. There's a whole interesting story about Ibn al-Haytham failing madness when he failed to do something that the ruler asked him to do, and then he was, he was, uh, uh, he, he was fearing execution or something. I mean, there's a whole interesting story. By the way, uh, this year is the 1,000th anniversary of the book that pioneered modern optics by Ibn al-Haytham, known as Kitab al-Manadir, the Aspectibus, or simply known as the Book of Optics. And so, Ibn Jim al-Khali says, Ibn al-Haytham is regarded as the father of the modern scientific method. I think there's a slight exaggeration there, but there's a whole discussion as to why he says that, and why it's not 100% correct. But anyway, most people in the West will never even have heard of him, this father of the scientific method. Now, why do I think Ibn al-Haytham is interesting? This is Ibn al-Haytham on stamps, etc., and this is in Haytham with the camera obscura, which was sort of the old way of capturing images. Not quite photography, but capturing images. Essentially, I mean, you just put a pinhole here, and you realize that because the rays of light uh, propagate in a rectilinear manner, etc., then uh, whatever is outside of here is going to be represented here, although upside down, and so you can observe things, or you can capture an image, so to speak. So... He was, I mean, he was famous for, one, for, for this, but not only this. This was just a little trick to show people things. But he was really famous. What he was most famous for, or what he became most famous for, is having almost worked out the laws of refraction, which today, by the way, in the Anglo-Saxon world, they are referred to as Snell's laws. In the Francophone world, they are referred to as Descartes' laws. <laughs> and we say, actually, Ibn Haytham did that 500 years before. If, the only difference is that Ibn Haytham didn't write them down in a mathematical manner. You know, the N1 sine theta 1 law. Now, can be considered as the first modern scientist, at least from the Muslim civilization, for the following reasons, I contend. His methodology was thoroughly naturalistic, did not invoke divine agency ever. He never said the, w the reason why these things work this way is because God, because God wants it to be this way, or because it has, you know, sort of final cause explanation, or purpose, or whatever. He never invoked any of that. <clears throat> he built an experimental methodology well before Bacon. He was always, okay, let's measure. Let's go back and check. Measuring eclipses and, and, and optical phenomena of all kinds. 
uh, rays into water, into glass, into all kinds of things. So to determine laws for the phenomena, this is the most important one, he said, it's not just, okay, we can see how things work, etc. We need to describe them in a law-like fashion. Now, let's jump to modern science. What is modern science in a nutshell? So now I'm sort of echoing a little bit what uh, Professor Hutchinson said earlier, although with a somewhat different emphasis on several aspects, as you will see. But this is good. Let me put a definition there. There are many kinds of definitions, as we heard, of course. There's some contention as to what do we mean by science in general and modern science in particular. But here's a definition that I find satisfactory. Modern science is an organized, systematic, and disciplined mode of inquiry. This is the key. I should have maybe highlighted this mode of inquiry. Because science, in the end, is a process. It's a process of investigation. It's a process of discovery. It's not explaining. It's not interpreting. It's not finding meaning. It is describing how things work. And sometimes in describing how things work, we are led to why is it this way because there may be some impossibilities or because these parameters don't work together and things like that. So sometimes we jump to the why, but most of the time it is simply how things function in nature. It's a process of discovering how things work. Based on, now, this is where we find some overlap with what we heard in the previous talk. Based on experimentation, empiricism, uh, this is from the ground up, that re produces repeatable, uh, we heard this, repeatable and applicable results universally. This is what I call objective. Objectivity. Independence from the experimenter or the observer or the scientist himself. Remove the scientist, put another guy somewhere else in Japan, anywhere, next year, ten years from now, and you, you should get the same result. Now, defining features. This is where we get into the troublesome stuff. Objectivity, I just said. <clears throat> repeatable, universal, measurability, uh, this is what uh, 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 Professor Hutchinson referred to as clarity or precision. You have to, you have to present things with numbers in a mathematical way, etc. Otherwise, how do I go and check what? Check some sentence. Uh, so measurability. Falsifiability, this is a word that we haven't heard. Falsifiability. A scientific claim Anything that claims to be scientific better contain in itself the premises of being checked, of being shown to be false, or being confirmed as being correct. Falsifiability. I'm very fond of this falsifiability criterion, this is Karl, Karl Popper's, or if you like, just to make words simple, testability. It, it better be testable. Something that cannot be tested, and that's why today we get into all kinds of, of arguments as to uh, uh, is the multiverse scientific? Um, is uh, our multi our super string theory is now scientific? And we get all kinds of discussion. No, yes, it can be indirectly. No, later we will see. And then this is the one. This is why I put this in there: <coughs> methodological naturalism, mm. or simply naturalism. The reason why I, I always say methodological naturalism is because when we talk about naturalism, usually. There are two types of naturalisms. There's methodological naturalism, which says, some, which, has, which says nothing about anyone's belief. It is not a philosophical position. It, isn't, it is certainly not a, an ideological position. It just says, methodologically, I am going to conduct my science in a purely naturalistic way. I am not going to invoke spirits. I am not going to claim that I understand God's purpose or anything like this. This is modern science. We may like it or we may not like it, but this is how modern science functions. And then there is ideological or philosophical naturalism that claims that everything out there is simply natural. Separate, meaning, there's no such thing as spirit. Don't waste my time. So, you can choose. But on the science, at least the, met the naturalism is common. Whether you're uh, uh, a theist or an atheist, um, in, in modern science, you have to accept this. You cannot do anything else. Now, Muslim thinkers' reactions to modern science. <clears throat> In the 70s and 80s, and 80s, three main schools attempted to properly define the relation between Islam and modern science. Because, indeed, this methodological naturalism created, of course, a, an in, a discomfort 
in people. So what are you saying? That I need to completely ignore God, completely ignore faith, completely ignore spirit, which we theists believe is another <laughs> dimension of humans, that there is another thing to this existence. It's not all matter and physics. And you're saying I need to just disregard it altogether. We can't do that. At least many of the theists, including the Muslims, said, uh, I don't know if I can do that. Um, but at the same time, science was progressing so much. It was making so much progress. It was explaining things that used to be understood or thought of as being in the realm of spirit or in the realm of metaphysics. And so they said, oh, wait a minute. We need to look at this carefully and see what we can and cannot. We don't have to just sort of you know, jump on the bandwagon and just accept it and roll with it. But at the same time, we cannot reject. I mean, somebody said earlier, I mean, what are the two extremes? We cannot take the one extreme and fall into scientism, and we cannot take the other extreme and start rejecting things just because I don't like it. It is this modern science is leaving God and all spirit completely out of the description. So people started to see that science has certain certain principles, what people refer to as metaphysical principles, meaning abstract, abstract principles or higher principles, and started to address them or to examine them, and started to see that it had certain flaws or certain limitations, certain ambiguities, and certain wrong consequences, and started to, there was a whole period of very fruitful uh, examination of modern science in the Muslim, Muslim <coughs> contemporary tradition. And so we got uh, three different reactions. Very interesting. Very, very different reactions. One is <clears throat> so-called sacred science. People refer to it as Islamic science, saying, well, look, this modern science, which is completely naturalistic, etc., is just a phase. It's just one attempt by humans. You know, we humans sort of like to try things. And so don't get too excited about it. In the end, this is not quite right. What we need to do really is go back to what humanity has always done, meaning look at the globality of existence. This is called sacred science. I'll examine this in a moment a little bit more. Then there was the uh, Sardar and, and co-author school of, also known as Islamic science, but for a completely different man, uh, uh, reason. This is the ethical science. Uh, modern science, they said, it completely ignores ethics. And that's why we get into, well, of course, I have all kinds of disagreements with, with at least some aspects of this, because they tend to sort of confuse the science and the applications of science, or the consequences of science run amok. And we have to distinguish between science and its principles and its practice and between the consequences. So they say, yeah, but look, look what we have done to the environment. Look at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, look at eugenics, and look at all kinds of things that go wrong when you allow this kind of modern science to function, and we need to put certain constraints and certain principles. And then there was the universal science of Abdul Salam, the Nobel Prize winner, who said, hey guys, just take it easy, science is universal. There is no such thing as Islamic science, etc. And I'll go back and explain this. Then between the sort of 80s until maybe 5-10 years ago, there was sort of a lull. There was no more discussion, maybe for all kinds of political reasons, etc. And there wasn't much uh, give and take on modern science and how to contend with it and how to try to harmonize and make peace with it. Uh, are there things in Islam that could be accepted or things in modern science that we could adopt? And now I think we see a new generation of voices, uh, some of whom you have received here, including uh, Gorshani, etc., who try to sort of look at all these issues and propose certain ideas. Let's go back now and see this is Sayyid Hussein Nasser, <coughs> an Iranian philosopher still alive, who now lives in the U.S., has lived in the U.S. since the Iranian Revolution because he was somewhat affiliated with the old regime and so left Iran during the revolution and now lives in the States. But he has a huge following in present-day Iran. I mean, just because politically he's not sort of uh, favored by the by the Islamic Republic of Iran now, doesn't mean that he doesn't. There are schools of thought that follow Nasser from afar. And he has all kinds of resonances with the Islamic public in general. Because the, the um, uh, Islamic public or the Muslim public 
has certain sensitivities with regard to modernity in general and modern science in particular, including evolution, etc. I won't be talking about evolution, Darwin's theory, or whatever, uh, and, and all kinds of other issues like this. And so people tend to like whenever there is a philosophy or there is any type of work that seems to contradict modern science or find some flaws in it, and they say, aha, uh -huh. so I don't have to take this whole modern science altogether because it, there are certain things in it that I cannot digest quite well. So it's good that some people are saying, I don't have to take it. Now, what does Nasser say? He says modern science is a human anomaly. He says this is the first time and the only time in our human history that we have had a purely naturalistic science. Science has always been theistic, culturally infused, etc. And this is the first time that we try to do this uh, noma separation or whatever, that science is completely independent of any beliefs and shouldn't be interfered with, etc. He says, uh, it has disconnected from God, it has produced major ills, uh, not just you know environmental catastrophes, etc., but the debasement of man, what he calls the fragmentation of our minds, disorder in our lives, etc., insists that science in the Islamic civilization considered nature as sacred. Uh, I should say that Sayyid Hussein Nasr is, is strongly, fundamentally Sufi in his philosophy and in his practice. In fact, he is so, so such a spiritualist that he believes in what is known as the perennial philosophy, which is some kind of a universal, all-time philosophy that has existed throughout most cultures, that agree on certain core spiritual philosophy, uh, principles. And so he says, he goes, which is something that most Muslims would not actually accept or uh, agree with, that nature is sacred. Nature, to <coughs> me personally and to many others, nature is not sacred. The cosmos, for him, being a unified, new unified realm of material and spiritual beings. Because you have to look at it all together. You cannot just look at the physical or material part. Access to information can be by reason or by individual intuition, including mystical exercises. So this, of course, clearly contradicts and violates the principles of modern science that I listed earlier. You know, empiricism, uh, starting from experiment, uh, uh, repeatability, objectivity, completely independent from the person who is doing this or who is finding the facts or whatever. And he said, no, 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 he said, no, I have other ways of reaching certain truths about the world and nature, and those should be included in the practice of discovery. Reject the objectives of modern science, and the ones that we talked about, in fact, you, you can see here, in fact, these two words are almost exactly the same as Professor Hutchinson uh, mentioned earlier, repeatability or, or, or reproducibility, he said, and accuracy, he said, clarity, precision, numbers, mathematics, etc. He says, this is Nasser says, oh, these objectives of modern science, no, they, they, these are not important. What is important are the values of, you can see now, purpose, meaning, beauty, harmony, etc. The other side of the coin. Now, Sardar, this is Zia Sardar, modern science is flawed and dangerous to some extent because of its metaphysical principles, meaning its abstract principles, including methodological naturalism, etc. But more importantly, I've talked with him many, many times, in fact I'm supposed to see him on Friday, to also to its social effects and technological applications. He says, the most important thing about science is not all these epistemological discussions that we are having that I personally am so fond of, and many of us, you know, spend a lot of time scratching our heads over. He says, the most important si thing about science is how it relates to humanity. You know, drop the philosophy. I'm slightly par paraphrasing Sarda. He says, just look at how it relates to humans, and how it serves some, some benefit, some interest, some purpose, meaning worldly purpose. And that is what we need to look at, the social relevance of science. And so he says, if you really want to construct a valid modern science, a good modern science, then you need to add to it, or at least constrain it, with the following Islamic principles, which I'm sure you can find in many other religious or even ethical systems. 
says you need to add to it divine unity because this is Tawheed, as I said, is the very first core principle of Islam. But then human trusteeship of earth, we are responsible or we should be responsible for this earth. We cannot just do what we want. Um, uh, Sadaq keeps repeating that nature should not be tortured. I think it was Bacon or somebody who said the, the, used the torture phrase or the torture word. Nature should not be tortured. Nature is our uh, trust. And we are given a trust and we need to take care of it properly. We are, it's not just for us to do whatever we want with it. Knowledge and knowledge and worship. Oops. Nature and uh, sorry, knowledge and worship should be linked together. Justice, public interest, etc. He said these are the principles that we need to make sure that they are upheld in the uh, scientific enterprise today. <coughs> and there's Abdul Salam, as you can see. I'm just showing you sort of different perspectives, different views. Abdul Salam says. Uh, science is universal. Only its applications are affected by cultural factors. Um, he does not believe there are any serious metaphysical, meaning conceptual problems in modern science that warrant a reconstruction. Clearly, he disagrees with both Nasser and Sarda. He says, no, science, the way it is defined nowadays and the way it is practiced is perfectly fine, even to me as a Muslim. There's no problem with it. There is no, this is an exact quote from him. There is no Islamic science just like there is no Chinese, Indian, Hindu, or Jewish science. Science is just science. He was labeled, he was attacked by all kinds of people, including Saldar and including some other people, as a conventionalist thinker or scientist, a modernist, a universalist, a business as usual guy, by his critics, like, okay, there's nothing to worry about, just go on with the business. So that's another point of view. He says, when you apply science, when you get to technology, when you get to social uh, benefits or practices related to science, that's where you have to be careful what you do and what you don't do. But the process of discovery of science is not flawed and there's nothing to worry about. Now, I'm finishing perhaps a little bit early, but that's fine. Uh, a harmonizing pro uh, proposal, this is my book that was just shown to you. The spirit of Averroes. Now, since I have a little bit of time, I need to explain a little bit this spirit of Averroes. Um, Averroes, whom I introduced earlier as a philosopher, scientist, uh, jurist, uh, Muslim thinker, etc., um, was known as the great commentator of Aristotle. In fact, in the West, he is almost, almost exclusively known as the great commentator. He was the one who wrote all kinds of commentaries on Aristotle, and those were the ones that were taken by uh, Thomas Aquinas and others and, and used later for the, for the uh, Aristotelian theology that came about. But what concerns me really most with Averroes is that Averroes wrote on how to reconcile philosophy and religion. This is 800 years ago. He said, philosophy is actually reasoned or rational knowledge. In fact, he said, there can be from philosophy uh, confirmed or uh, um, guaranteed or uh, accepted knowledge, knowledge that we, can, that we can ascertain. And he said, what do we do when we have knowledge that is objective? And then we have scripture. And you read the scripture and you find sometimes identical or some things that seem to relate well. And sometimes you find things that seem to contradict or seem to be saying very different things. What do you do? And he was concerned with this. And his principle of harmonization, he said, once we have checked and found that the objective knowledge is really certain, then we need to do hermeneutics, interpretation, reinterpret the scriptures. He said, please understand that scriptures are written in language. And because they are written in language, they have layers of meanings. Somebody could understand it in a very literalistic way. Somebody could understand it in a much more metaphorical way. Somebody could understand it in a much more spiritual way, in a deeper manner. And he said, in fact, 
the more knowledgeable amount of people in any community are the ones who are able to go deeper than the first level. And he cites the Quran to say, those who are able, those among you who have knowledge, as the verse says, are obligated to go deeper into that knowledge. So, if you are given this gift of mind, intelligence, etc., then you must not stop at the first level and go deeper. And he says, when we go deeper is when we are able to reconcile all these things. So, he says, truth is one. That this, uh, what was it called, uh, the uh, double truth, uh, 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 duplex veritas, as it was uh, developed later, you're saying, but people misunderstood ever, was saying, there are two truths. There is the philosophical truth and there is the religious truth. Uh, but in fact, he was not saying that at all. When you read his books and they are, they are transparent, they are limpid, he's saying there's only one truth of, in the world for anything. But the way it is explained in the scripture sometimes, with relation to the creation of the world, or with relation to the history of humans, or what have you, is in a language that can be understood imperfectly by some people, much better by other people, and then you can find some bridges between the two, and realize that it is all fine. And so I went back and I said, hey, this applies perfectly well to science today. In fact, it applies even more to science, because science is really the realm where you can have objective knowledge, where you can guarantee that this is a fact. So I tell people, look, evolution is a fact. How do we know it's a fact? Because there, is, there, there are tons of evidence, and this evidence is independent of me. It's not like the Westerners are claiming. Everybody can do and go and check and, and dig and find fossils and, and analyze the DNA and find the uh, mutations and all of this. This is objective knowledge, and once you have done it a thousand times by 2,000 people in 10,000 places and times, then you conclude that this is objective knowledge. And when you have this objective knowledge, then it becomes a must, it becomes an obligation on the people of knowledge to go deeper into the scriptures and try to find uh, a harmonization. So that's the harmonizing proposal in a way, in, in, uh, in two minutes, that I present in the book. Adopt modern science in all its rigorous methodology and results. Here I agree with Abdul Salam. I don't think there is serious problem. Add an optional theistic interpretative mantle, if you believe. So for Muslims or theists of any kind, they can add their theism as an interpretation. It must not interfere with the practice. It does not come at the level of the process of science, but it comes at the level of interpreting the results or what we see in the world. Universally impose stringent ethical standards like those of Islam. This is essentially what Saldar was saying. We cannot allow science to just go and do whatever it wants. And tomorrow I have a talk in the afternoon on Islam and modern technology or technologies. And we'll be looking a little bit at that. Um, accept the Quran's guidance and philosophy of knowledge. Make hermeneutics obligatory each time there is any apparent contradiction. So I just explained, which I took almost directly from Averroes. Keep in mind the multi-level meanings inherent in the Quran when reading the verse dealing with natural phenomena and other things. But here we're dealing with science and natural phenomena. So I'll stop here and thank you very much. That's great. I'm actually helpful. Oh, Ted Peters is kicking off uh, already from the question. I like to say I <coughs> genuinely appreciate how you formulated the central issue as theistic science uh, versus naturalistic science and giving us your four constructive proposals at the end really uh, helps move the discussion along. Uh, let me uh, ask you a question about uh, evolution as a fact. Um, you did appeal to the rationalist school during the classic period of Islam what do you think about the occasionalists? Mm -hmm. The occasionalists who would say that God is the all-determining reality from moment to moment to moment, so that the evolutionary process would not be due to independent causation, but actually to God's action. Uh, I just happen to have a friend who's an Islamic uh, <coughs> scholar uh, who is also a biologist, but who denies Darwinian evolution because he denies secondary causation. 
So what do you think about the occasionalist interpretation of uh, evolutionary history? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, these are two related questions. Uh, there's first the occasionalism as a general theology, and then there's how it applies or can it apply, and can it be called upon to explain acceptance or rejection of evolution. Occasionalism, for those who are not so familiar, occasionalism is the dominant, now overwhelmingly dominant theology in Islam or in Muslim practice today uh, that essentially claims that God recreates the world at every instant and so if you make these delta t's infinitely small you can consider it as essentially continuous but at every t at every moment God is essentially changing this and so he just made me go like this and he made me go like this and the whole world is being recreated at every instant, which allows him and just and, and, and thereby explains why at, at a, a certain moment he might decide to just you know change something suddenly, and then we would call that a miracle. And so the occasionalists, because they wanted to preserve miracles, and I said earlier, I said miracles really sort of turn out to be the the crux of the matter in theology, to a large extent, at least in Islam. Uh, came up with this theology to essentially uh, free God's hands, if you like. So God can do whatever He wants at every moment. And so this, so we say, but look, if I do, if I drop things, they always go down. They never go up. And they say because that is a pattern that represents God's habit. This is how God sort of goes about in the world. He just He likes to when things are dropped, they, He likes to see them go down. And so He lets them go down. But it doesn't mean that tomorrow you might drop something, it won't go up. It might go up. Say, but we have never seen it. Yeah, but it doesn't mean that it cannot happen. So that's the occasionalist tradition. To me, it, 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 really, it, it really bothers me. I mean, it, I, I'm, my, my philosophy of science in the end, <laughs> if I may summarize it in maybe one or two words, it's Occam's razor. You know, simplify to the extreme. Anything that is simpler is, is much better. I know there are issues with Occam's razor, and it's not always perfectly fine and beautiful and simple, etc. But as much as we can, and we have found that in history and in science and in nature, things are really simpler than we tend to think. And so, if God has created the world and put certain laws and certain regularities, the regularities in the Quran are repeated dozens of times. Look at how the moon comes back and look at how the phases of the moon and look at how the sun rises all the time and look at how God has made this and that. God is praising this regularity, this beauty, etc. But you're telling me that God is just, you know, just does whatever He wants. Uh, so, so that's the occasionalism. But people, people subscribe, as I said, to occasionalism simply because they don't want to contend with the issue of miracles. Now, in, on the idea of evolution, first of all, the majority of the traditional, traditionally thinking Muslims, scholars or non-scholars, do not accept evolution. Whether they justify it by occasionalism or not is a different issue, but they don't accept. Why they don't accept evolution is because they stop at the first level of scriptural reading and they say, God created Adam one day and then put him in the, in the garden and then he made a fatal mistake or something, and then he was brought down. And so when God says, I created Adam, yeah, he didn't say, I waited, you know, three million years of evolution. He said, yeah, but the, the, the word creation is very fuzzy and could mean all kinds of things. And we can see, we can see <laughs> evolution on earth, and we can see it. And many Muslims, you know, nowadays, they say, oh, for animals, we don't mind evolution, fine. <laughs> so there's evolution all around us, yeah, fine. But... Show me human evolution, and then, of course, we get into the nitty-gritty of things. And we say, okay, but look at the mutations that I can show you now, and look at the antibiotics. <laughs> you know, uh, it's not the reason, by the way, I didn't take the antibiotics. Um, <laughs> and we get into these discussions. So, the more knowledgeable people, like your friend, know that they have to find some justification for this. They cannot just stop at the literalistic reading and say, because God said I created Adam, case closed, there was nothing before Adam. They have to sort of explain it in a way. And so what they say is, Adam is one of those instances where God decided that I'm not going to follow sort of the pattern or the law 
that we observe in nature, at a certain moment I did something different and I just created a, a different species. And they say, okay, so that's the way it worked. And we say, but wait a minute, what about the fossils that show antecedents to Adam? Oh, those, there's all kinds of contention with those and they start sort of waving them away. So. Do you think occasionalism was a factor in the decline of Islam? I mean, there are probably many factors, but do you think the fact that you know, God could do whatever he wanted sort of undermined the sense of laws of nature and so on? Um, no, definitely in, in terms of uh, theological and intellectual and even scientific thinking. I mean, you saw how the rationalistic school of theology, how it was going. I mean, you were getting to atomic physics and you were getting into... And then, uh, you know, this whole issue of miracles just stopped, stopped the whole thing in its tracks. Mm. Uh, no, I really believe that theologically and intellectually, uh, occasionalism just put the brakes on the Islamic civilization. There were many other factors, of course. I mean, in the evening, if you like, we can talk about why did the Islamic civilization decline? There's a, I mean, that's the million dollar question. But uh, uh, in terms of at least theological and intellectual decline, that was certainly a factor. Thank you. Uh, Martin. Hi. Um, if I understood you correctly, uh, you believe that uh, science and uh, the Quran uh, are compatible. Mm -hmm. And uh, many Muslims believe that whilst the Quran is not a scientific book, it nevertheless is a book that contains science. science. Did you say science science. Or science? science. Science. Yes. Science. 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 Not science. 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 <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a crucial, it's a crucial yes, discussion. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no apology. <laughs> no, no, um, hmm. So, if I've understood you correctly, that that's your that's your position. Um, and no, many, no, many Muslims believe that the, the, the Quran contains scientific science that, that couldn't have been known by by Muslims of of, oh, yeah. of the time. But, yeah, but that's not my position. Yeah. But uh, it's the position of many Muslims. Yes, sure. Yeah, okay. But if we look at the, Qur the Quran, Surah 21, verse 33, where it says, uh, It is he who created the night and the day, and the sun and the moon, all the celestial bodies that swim along, each in its rounded course. Mm -hmm. Seems to be a clear uh, uh, affirmation of a geocentric understanding of the, u of the, uh, of the, of the universe. Uh, and, and that verse was for centuries by Muslims uh, taken as such until the Copernican uh, revolution when we understood actually that the sun and the moon do not swim round in their rounded course around the earth but they swim round um, you know they, they, they orbit the, the sun hmm. yes with it, with, so, so my question is the claim that the, the Quran A contains science and B is of divine origin would it not be much stronger if it if the Quran had a clear and unambiguous verse that said something like, despite appearances to the contrary, the earth revolves around the sun and not vice versa? A clear scientific prediction that no human could possibly have known in 6th century Arabia, but which later would have been uh, confirmed by, by modern science centuries later. Okay. First of all, um, I do not agree whatsoever that the Quran contains science or scientific facts. Uh, my book is available over there, read chapter 5. It's like 30 or 40 pages. It is one of the chapters that gets me into trouble with my, with my brethren. Trust me. Uh, I have, as you said, many, and when I said I don't, but I don't agree with that, you said, but most, many Muslims do. I said, yeah, I know, but I don't. Um, so I think it is very simplistic, I think very erroneous, I think it is um, misunderstanding both science and the scriptures to make those links, and there are many who make them, I agree with you. But they are wrong, they are just simply wrong. You yourself said the Quran is not a scientific book, so it's not a scientific book. It wasn't its purpose to try to show people, you know, one theory or another. So why stop at heliocentrism? Then uh, why not tell us about quantum mechanics? Why shouldn't the Quran tell us about biological evolution? Why not tell us about geological, you know, tectonics? And then, then we go on and on. Then how come it didn't tell us about this? How come it didn't tell us about that? Because that is not the purpose of the Quran whatsoever. The purpose of the Quran is to tell people about the existence of God and the necessity to relate to him. Now, whether you accept it or not, is it's completely your freedom. And how to deal with each other in a manner that is um, suitable to the purpose of our creation. That's, that's the Quran in a nutshell. That's the Quran. Now, it, it, 
it, it speaks of signs, as I said, and I showed you several, uh, several verses that talk about the sun and the moon and the rivers and the mountains and the air and regularity, etc. And there are two purposes for those, for those verses. One, to tell people that it is extremely important to go out and really observe and understand the world around us, that life is not just my relation with you, me and you, it is also with the animals, it is also with the environment, it is also with the cosmos at large, etc. This is one. And number two, to try to entice people to go and understand. In fact, in one of the verses I like to quote, it says, go and explore the world to see how creation was started. Not even how creation was made, it said, it said how it was started. Meaning it continues, meaning you need to go and understand how it has uh, uh, unfolded throughout the big history ages of millions and billions of years. So, now we could pick, and by the way, be very careful with translations of the Quran. Translations of the Quran are a big, big, big problem. There are all kinds of translations, and I would contend that maybe more than 90% of them are biased. They reflect more the person's understanding or wishes to read into the Quran than what is actually stated. I am perfectly fluent in Arabic, it's my mother tongue, and still it is not easy for me to understand. Then when I read, look, when I, when I show any verses, you know what I do? There are websites that give you three, four, five translations of the same verse. And I go in there and I start to sort of take a little bit from here, a little bit from here, and try to, why? I don't, I'm not picking and choosing to suit my meaning, because I try to stick as much as I can to the Arabic version that is in my mind. And that is very, very hard and very dangerous to pick one translation, and we find this all the time, not just in science. We find this in the status of women, in the status of jihad, and this, and somebody picks a verse from here and says, look, look, look what it says, but wait a minute. What does it mean in Arabic exactly, and in what context was it revealed, and how is, is it supposed to be universally ap applied, or was it for one specific instance, and things like this. Mm. <clears throat> Very interesting, thank you. A lot of parallels with the Christian world. And all yeah, sure. just, <laughs> just, yeah. Yeah, Me? I'm sorry. I think you were okay. first, but... <laughs> um, about your harmoni harmonizing proposal, your first um, statement there was adopt sciences and its method and uh, methods and results. Mm -hmm. um, I, I should think, I, I'd like to press you a bit on what it really comes to. Um, and just to highlight, just to, to, uh, to make a point, I felt a little something uh, about uh, the British Journal for Medical, a, 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 a big medical journal, a British medical journal, um, had an issue of the following nature. It asked, um, it's ordinary reviewers that accepted or uh, uh, reviewed, sent in papers to re review the papers, all the papers that were published in that journal over the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, so from five years back up till 50, 50 years back, and ask the reviewers to, to explain whether or not they thought the results of those papers were still valid. Mm -hmm. um, less than 15% were uh, were still uh, viewed as valid results. Mm -hmm. So to adopt modern science and its methods, uh, it seems to me must always be sort of surrounded by some tentativeness. Um, oh, sure. To adopt science, well, really isn't to adopt <laughs> science. It's well. Uh, so that's my question. Okay. Um, no, I agree with you that it is, there is a lot of tentativeness and there is a lot of uh, going back a little bit. Sometimes we walk <coughs> in a certain direction and we claim something and we say, oh, wait a minute, mistake. That was wrong. Uh, the, the measurement was flawed or the observation, all kinds of astronomical uh, observations that turn out to be, to be incorrect. Uh, I know, I'm an astrophysicist. But we don't jump, you know, the next day I read, you know, this week's nature uh, uh, edition and then uh, tomorrow I go and harmonize it with the Quran. I don't do this. I mean, what I mean by science and its results, I mean in the long term, after a long period of understanding, etc. Besides, I'm not concerned with the latest results of the lattice function for the energy of the, you know, crystal. I'm interested in the big ideas, the big results that, that science brings forth uh, in terms of human's history, in terms of the existence of... Uh, forces, energies, other worlds, etc. So if tomorrow, for example, we discover that there are other worlds, meaning 
habitable world, etc., with perhaps some life, some animals roaming somewhere, or even some bacteria, or some, or some trees. Uh, and then if, for example, the year after we find some <coughs> intelligent species out there, then that is a result that will make me rethink a little bit of our place and how does this relate with the, what the Quran says about humans and, and trustee shape and so on and so forth. I'm not talking about specific results, but just to go back. But, 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 uh, yeah. So for instance, even when it comes to Big Bank of Moby, for instance, that idea, that very idea was yeah. rejected in the 70s. Yeah, yeah. No, know. no, not in the 70s, no. No, no, by the 70s it had, the, in the 60s already we had, we had because, cosmic background already. Because, yeah, because it, <coughs> the original idea was uh, articulated by a Belgian priest, I, I presume. Yeah, yeah, well, okay. Uh, um. First of all, as I said, we have to wait until the community has agreed that this is an established result. And this result is important enough for it to be harmonized with religion, theism, whatever. I'm not concerned with little topics or little results, and I'm not concerned with the latest discovery. I'm concerned with long-term established facts, what we call facts. Now, these facts can be fine-tuned a little bit. Oh, okay, so we have found some life, but it's not really big animals, it's only small fish in the rivers. So, okay, so we have changed it a little bit, but it doesn't change the, the fact that there is now life out elsewhere. Or we have found some intelligent uh, beings out there but they only communicate through electromagnetic radiation. They haven't yet uh, discovered, I don't know, neutrinos or something. I say, okay, well, it does, still doesn't change the big fact. So I'm interested in the big facts that science establishes through a collective process. It's not, I agree, you agree, I like this paper, so I vote yes for it. No, it's the collective community that advances I don't know if 10 years is good enough, or 20 years, or it, it depends on the specifics of the cases. Thank you. Did you have a question? I, I do, yeah. Well, yeah. It, so it's a question uh, also on your um, harmonization approach that you and perhaps some other uh, Muslim thinkers might take. Uh, I'm just curious about the details. So of course, you have a similar issue in Christianity, Christians um, uh, dealing with the results of modern science, modern human evolution being the, the, the central issue. Um, and it's very important for those who are uh, hesitant to fully embrace the, the modern science that uh, uh, the people that wish to go back and reinterpret, um, reject traditional interpretations of things like the creation or the fall of Adam in, in Genesis, uh, that it not be seen as simply ad hoc, right? Mm -hmm. that, that, um, that somehow that science can at, at most be a prompt to cause us to rethink on independent grounds, principled grounds, why we should be interpreting this text differently. Mm -hmm. And one might appeal to the idea of what's involved in an independent creator communicating to finite human beings, the idea of accommodation, God accommodating himself, or we might appeal to the culture of the particular author, the human author of the text would have been writing in, but it becomes much more likely to be accepted if you can make a case uh, on independent grounds that there's a plausible way of reading this text that's not in conflict. And I'm just wondering, yeah. has a very similar discussion played out uh, in Islamic circles, and how does it go? It's a, it's a very, very interesting and very important issue. Um, I am tempted to say yes and no. I am tempted to agree with you and disagree with you at the same time. I'll tell you why. Uh, let's agree first. Let me first where I agree with you. Uh, it is important that we don't present science as, you know, sort of the slayer of, of myths. Uh, that science is an intrinsic component of human knowledge and human tradition. And that just because modern science is naturalistic doesn't mean that it is here to just break all kinds of things. Otherwise, there will be a strong backlash, there will be a strong reaction. And we are already seeing, we have been seeing for several decades now, you know, this resurgence or this emergence of so-called traditionalism, capital T. You know, people say modernity, you're completely wrong, you reject, go back and find, you know, old philosophies, this and that. Uh, so it's very important that we take science carefully and integrate it into the course of human history and human knowledge with all kinds of emotions, uh, non-scientific ways of understanding the meanings, etc. This is all very important. At the same time, I think science is very particular and needs to be presented on its own merits that science is able to present uh, confirmed knowledge. 
and we do not look at it as being just another perspective on things. You say, okay, so it's, a, it's another point of view, it's another theory, you know, the mis misunderstood word theory, or it is just like a philosophy, or an art, uh, a new school of whatever. No, science is, there's a lot of objective stuff in science, and we need to make people aware of this, so that when they deal with science, they don't deal with it in the postmodernistic uh, uh, way that, you know, it's, it becomes a meta-narrative. Science is not a meta-narrative. Science is not even a narrative. I mean, it's a narrative in a way of it describes how things work in time and space, etc. But it's not, you know, sort of a, a story. We like to present it as a story because people like stories and like to listen to stories. But there is a huge amount of objectivity. And the whole problem is how to show people where is the objectivity. And at the same time, you know, in, just to publicize again my book, in, uh, in chapter three, I, uh, chapter three is titled "Science and its and its critics," uh, and I try to show people that look, science is not this perfect enterprise where people are objective and neutral and they, pre they produce results perfectly clear and we agree in the end and, and there are there are no issues. I said there's a lot of personal <laughs> stuff. There's a lot of you know subjectivity in how things are done and there are many mistakes and there are many ethical violations in science. You know, and there is, uh, so, but there is a lot of objective stuff there too. So we need to be able to distinguish and extract the objective thing and present it on a pedestal, so to speak. Uh, and I think it is very important and I think it is missing in the general culture, in my culture and uh, world culture in general, uh, this special feature of science. And I think we, we need to sort of push that, that little bit more strongly. Thank you. Yes. Um, have you said that if you have confirmed objective knowledge, then you have to go back and reevaluate your reading of the Quran. Yep. Can you give me an example of how that might work? Oh, Adam is, is a perfect example. Okay. Adam is a perfect example. Uh, <clears throat> for example, even the whole idea of garden, etc. And we go back and we find, so this is where we sort of link it with other, uh, other roots of interpretation and we say, yeah, but the word for garden that is used here, or the word garden in Arabic, is used elsewhere in many other places to mean an earthly garden, or to mean a forest, or to mean uh, uh, some place here on earth. So it doesn't mean that there was you know, some heavenly garden that uh, Adam was at and then fell here one day because you know, he had the uh, earth or something. Um, and then we go back and we try to explain that if you, if you adopt this evolutionary mindset and reread the whole thing again not pick you know one verse here and one verse there but reread the whole thing with an evolutionary mindset do you find any problem and the people yeah no now that I look at it that way there's no problem so then there is no problem so if you reinterpret it globally collectively all together with a certain mindset uh, you can find you can see that there is some coherent narrative if you like and once you achieve this coherent narrative then everybody's happy Please, could you put the last frame on again? I wanted to take something. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, um, Peter, right. You mentioned that um, many Muslims have trouble with the notion of the evolution of man. Yeah. Now, what about biology teaching in universities? Mm -hmm. is, is there a problem there, or is... Uh, in most Muslim universities, human evolution is not taught. Um, in uh, most or um, a large majority of Muslim educational curricula, biological evolution and human evolution are not taught. So people just, you know, come to the university having never heard of Darwin. I mean, heard of Darwin from far like this, like, you know, this atheist guy who just came and, you know, sort of rebutted religion or whatever, you know, some vague misconception. Uh, but they have never heard a lecture in school about evolution or Darwin uh, in the largest majority of the whole Muslim world. In some other, there's, there's a whole research now of what is taught about evolution in the places where it is taught uh, and how much do people accept it in many places the teachers themselves tell the students, look, I'm teaching you this stuff, but really it's just part of the curriculum and don't worry about it too much. Um, so, 
No, we still have quite quite uh, quite uh, a distance to go. Um, yes, within Islam there are many different cultures, so, so, such as Turkish or or mm -hmm. um, Uyghur or uh, Indonesian. Do you notice any differences between interpretations of science and adoption of modern science within different cultures within Islam? For example, we view Turkey as somewhat more modern than, for example, Saudi Arabia. So does it also relate to science and religion? Yeah, absolutely. You are right. And that's, that's an important issue to also keep in mind, that the Muslim world is not monolithic by any measure. There's a huge spectrum and variety of attitudes, cultures, interpretations, uh, positions with regard to science, politics, women, you name it, in different parts of the Muslim world. Uh, <coughs> Turkey is a special case. Turkey is perhaps a bit too modern for us, we think. Uh, but uh, Dennis has been in Turkey and knows Turkey better than me. He speaks a bit Turkish, uh, so he can speak. But uh, no, I'm just joking a little bit. Turkey, Turkey, is, um, Turkey for a long time was secular, was hugely strongly secular. Secular in the French sense, you know, not even in the American or, or British sense, in the French sense. And now it is sort of finding more harmony and more balance. Uh, so I think, and Turkey is now being considered by many of the Arab Muslim countries, especially the ones that are experiencing a revolution nowadays, as the model to follow. Uh, at least in the present sense, in the present sort of more harmonious way. Not the secular, Kemalist, strong, anti-religious situation that they went through. But in the present, like, you know, we can be modern, but we have our tradition and there's no problem. So they teach, they have been, I think they always taught evolution, etc. In fact, they teach it in a, in a very, at least agnostic, agnostic uh, mindset. Dennis, would you say? Depends on the university. Oh, I see. So in some universities, it is a little bit more... Uh, it depends what, yeah. The universities theistic. vary a lot in okay. that respect, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so Turkey, Turkey is now really turning into a role model for most of the, uh, of the Arab Muslim world. Um, the other extremes, of course, are Saudi Arabia, where, uh, where the um, understanding and interpretation of, of Islam is, is extreme, is fundamentalistic, on all kinds of issues, not just on science. I mean, I cannot, for the life of me, think of evolution being taught in Saudi Arabia. Uh, but not on that, I mean, just even on, on, on women, on, on politics, on, uh, on the status of non-Muslims, on all kinds of issues. So there's a whole huge spectrum, but Saudi Arabia is really a special case. I mean, it's, it's the only country where women have some special problems, like cannot drive and things like this. Uh, the only country. Uh, I live in the Emirates, which is just next door to Saudi Arabia. And very, very liberal. I mean, very liberal yeah, for an Arab Muslim country. Uh, women are free to do whatever they want. They're free to cover or not cover. Uh, Science is fine. Uh, Non-Muslims uh, have, uh, you know, full rights, uh, etc. Um, churches everywhere, uh, mosques. Uh, sorry, mosques, temples of other uh, other traditions. So it varies quite a bit. We're making progress. I mean, it's it's coming there with all kinds of the modernity. Modernity having come to the to the Arab Muslim world is is an interesting historical issue. How it came to the Arab Muslim world is, is a problem in itself. I mean, it came with the with the with the colonialism, with colonialism, and so of course, by definition, it was a problem. Um, and uh, all kinds of issues like this. So there, there's there's a big spectrum. Thank you. Yes, question. Uh, when we talk about miracles, can yeah. we say that the science takes end with interpretation uh, responses? Um, well, modern science does not accept miracles. So, modern science would say, there, is, there are no miracles. It's not like there is something that, when it happens, it's the end of science and we cannot say anymore. If you take the scientists say, what happens when a miracle occurs? They say, miracle doesn't occur, what are you talking about? There's no such thing, so your proposition never occurs, never takes place, so there is no issue. Um, for the theists, or for those who believe in miracles, then it depends on whether you are, again, occasionalist or whether you are a rationalist. And you accept that, okay, there may be certain 
sudden transformations or sudden changes or something, but it is just God having used whatever laws of nature or whatever uh, processes in nature could have led to such an effect, but there is no violation. Or if you're on the occasion, you say, oh, God decided that at this moment he's going to do something different. Nobody should uh, complain. So it really depends. It depends on how you view miracles or how you define miracles and whether you accept miracles to begin with or not. Well, back. And then I think we might have No, you are right, um, and you're pointing to something that is extremely important, and that is this uh, love-hate relationship that Muslims have with science. Nowadays, I'm talking about today. Um, when you come to the applications of science, the usage and benefits from science in society, Muslims are all for it. Whether it comes from the West or from the East, then that Orientalist or Western origin or source is you know, forgotten. And hey, yeah, of course, we can have this. Yeah, let's do this. And that's no problem. It is only when you come to these, what I call the metaphysical principles of modern science, that there is some issue. Now, and that is the reason why, as you may have noted, when Abdus Salam in the 70s, in the 70s or and 80s, was insisting on this universal character of modern science, was labeled a Western, Westernizer or a or a modernist business as usual. Oh yeah, of course, you were educated at Imperial College, and now you have your center in Italy. Of course, what can we expect of you? You're going to say that, of course, right? So, but that is sort of, you know, uh, uh, not addressing the issue. Um, there is this issue of, is modern science Western or not? And that is a general issue to be addressed by everybody. Not just for the Muslims, but you are right that the Muslims look at it as, of course, the Westerners having gone through their enlightenment phase and having put God uh, on the margins, on the side, now have gotten to science and made it also secular. And you, modern Muslims, I was educated in the U.S., so of course they would look at me like, oh, of course, you would adopt that, wouldn't you? Uh, but when we examine, and it is difficult to you know, sort of argue and, dis and discuss with people, what are the issues and, and what makes it Western? What is Western in it? That requires some, some higher level of discourse, but we have to get through, we have to go through that. We've just got time for Ian's question. Okay, well, I'll make it one question. I had another question, but I, I, wanted, to, I, I wanted to come back on the, on the answer you just gave about miracles. Right. Because I want to disagree with at least the way you phrased your answer. Because your answer was that modern science rules out miracles. And, and I think that's a, that that's an incorrect way to describe the, the situation, at least from my perspective. I would want to contradict that. I would say that science is unable to cope with miracles and uh, unable to establish or disestablish them uh, because of its methods. But it, but, but it seemed to me the way you answered, and I want to give you an opportunity to clarify this in case you, I misunderstood it, it seemed to me the way you answered, you had made a slide from what you said was method methodological naturalism to what amounted to an ontological naturalism in your answer to, to miracles. So, you know, perhaps you and I both think uh, that miracles can take place, and, and perhaps, nevertheless, we both think uh, that science is very important and, and that, and that uh, it has much to say. And, uh, so, so, again... My, my point is, actually, to disagree with the, what you said earlier, and I invite you to clarify whether you really think the practice of science, as opposed to what I would call scientism, excludes the possibility of miracles. First of all, I did not slide onto ontological uh, naturalism. <clears throat> ontological naturalism is a claim that there is nothing but the physical natural world. I did not say that. 
I said, you are free to believe that there are spirits, that you have a spirit, that there are the spirits in the world, that there is a connection with God, that we pray, that we establish some spiritual life. That you are free to do, and that is your complete right. Whether you believe in methodological naturalism or not, you have the freedom to take this or not. So, let's agree on methodological naturalism. I did not slide into that. That is complete somebody's freedom. I'm addressing now whether miracles in the framework of methodological naturalism can occur or not. Now, if I said to the gentleman, I said, if you can accept that what we may regard as miracles have occurred within the laws of physics, the laws of nature, that God intervened or pushed or did something in the world that is transparent to us, as I've always said, but consistent, there is no violation of the laws of physics, then I don't have a problem with that. So, I'm saying, the key idea is to stay within methodological naturalism. And, if modern science, as I defined it, requires methodological naturalism, then it denies the possibility of having miracles in the general public's definition, which is a violation of uh, natural causation or natural... natural Phenomenal. I think we have to stop there. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.